Hello and um, welcome back. I uh, thought I'd do a little video on diesel injectors. Um, not a lot to them really, or not the ones I'm playing with. Uh, these ones are from Perkins. Well, there's two sets for six cylinder, six, three, five. Um, they just need uh, a bit of love. One engine was running incredibly rich, which was because of the valve tappet clearances, which you can find another one of my videos on. It's quite a recent video in terms of what's on the listing. But you can see here all the carbon build up um, on the end of that. Whereas, say, for example, let me try and find a cleaner one for you. Uh, it's not a bad looking one there. Not really very comparable, really. But So, the way to test them is simply put them onto diesel test rig like this, which I'll set up in a minute. Um, I'll show you the, the, the spray pattern and what they can look like. Um, and yeah, basically, I've got some new nozzles here, which are here. So basically, you take the whole injector apart, and maybe this is a better one to show you. you just make out inside some new nozzles. Um, the unscrew, the bodies on these unscrew, some I've undone already. You unscrew the bottoms. And that part there is, uh, is replaceable. Uh, inside the rest of it is basically a spring and a, con and a, uh, a wind, or a cap which wind down to put a certain amount of pressure on the spring and that's what your setting is set by um, and then there's a, a copper ring which is here that goes in the body I'll show you that in closer in a sec so what you want from diesel injection is a nice atomized spray if your injector is kind of spitting out the fluid the diesel then you're going to get um, a really poor propagation of burn as they call it what this basically means is Fluids don't burn. In order to get a fluid to burn, you have to make it into a spray. And the reason you have to do that is you need to combine it with oxygen in the air. Um, anything that's dense and hard won't burn. So this is why uh, petrol engines back in the day had carburetors and that would carburate the fuel mixture. So you would draw up some of the petrol, that would mix it in the carburation with air as it was going through the, the um, butterfly valve on the carburetor and that mixture, that charge of fuel would go into the engine and then a spark would cause it to combust. So there's, the, the, there's a scoliometric process to all that but that's petrol, I'm not going to talk about that right now. Diesel, is, uh, diesel still has to be sprayed at very high pressures. Um, these injectors are spraying at um, over 2,500 psi. For example, your bicycle tyres are about 60 psi, maybe uh, newer ones, uh, earlier ones would be 30 psi. Car tyres are on average about 32 psi. So these are operating at 2,500 psi, and this is old stuff. The stuff you're getting in modern cars and vehicles now are running at far, far higher pressures. Um, I believe, and don't quote me on this, my Transit Custom, which is a modern van, it's a couple of years old, it's, you're working at 22,000 psi, it's common rail. It's incredibly high pressures. And the reason we do, the reason that's done is because the higher compression ratio in diesel, the cleaner the burn. But that's a whole level of science I'm not going to go into here. I just thought I'd do a little video on diesel, diesel injection. Um, I've actually got two different types here. So these are from Perkins. Um, and these ones are from a BMC. These are 1.5 BMC. This is all CAV, C-A-V, or Delphi, which licensed, uh, was, which, which bought a license from CAV, I believe. CAV are the original manufacturer of this equipment. Now these are actually basically the same bodies if you look carefully. Very, very similar. But the nozzles are different. These are, I think, pin pull type. Basically what that is, is these ones go into an engine which is called direct uh, injection. So when the fuel goes into the engine, uh, the injector sprays it in the head where it fits and it's spraying it straight down into the piston chamber into the crown of the piston and there is a pre-combustion chamber built into the piston. So if you look down at some pistons on engines, uh, I'll put a picture up here to show you. You can see like a phallic symbol, you know? Yep, a lot of phallic symbols in engineering. But that creates a swell process. And the idea of that is you're helping the fuel in there to mix. It's also to do where the hot point of the compression of air, because a diesel's process of combusting is not an ignition like a spark. You're generating such high pressure you're squashing that air so high it gets hot and that heat is what causes the diesel to go bang so the way to sort of understand that again go back to bicycles if you've got an old-fashioned bicycle pump remember the old long ones now some of you kids that might be watching this have probably got these double action pumps now and they're a bit more efficient but when i was younger you had a single uh, sing a long long rod and a single hand we pushed down and it's one direction it would draw back 
and it would push and squash the air. And that squashing of air would make the end your other hand was holding get hot. It wasn't heat from your hand, you were actually squashing air. Same principle here. You're compressing those gases to such a high volume that they get hot. Um, the compression ratio on diesels can, can, can range from various types. They're much higher than petrol. Um, you can squash um, atmospheric pressure down to, you know, crikey, um, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 times. And it, you start going up to 300 and something PSI on, on naturally aspirated engines. If you've got a uh, turbo, which is slightly different, situation there but the basic principle here though is because you're generating such high compression in the cylinder you need to then spray at high pressure in order to be able to get that through that that, that pressure body so this old stuff is all mechanically governed so for a not slightly slight tangent here here i've got on the bench an old cav type um injection pump from a bmc engine which would work which corresponds to these injectors here i'm not necessarily actually reconditioning this i just took it apart to assess it this is from a 1.8 bmc but it's so rusty I, i'm just going to pack it all up and send it off for a part exchange unit i can't i can't touch um injectors the pumps i don't have the equipment for it injectors i can sort out that's not a problem but injector bodies uh injector pumps you need a machine to calibrate them and you do have to calibrate them if you don't calibrate them they can uh, meter far too much fuel which means deliver too much fuel um and you can have issues with that so they are very highly calibrated and super clean you need to be very very clean with this stuff um but there we go so i don't really have the room for a, a diesel injection testing rig in here Although this is the new workshop um, I moved a while ago. Uh, it's slowly but surely coming on. It's t taking a little while. We'll get there in the end. Um, I've got a lathe down the end now. I've got a hydraulic ram, a press, bandsaw, pillar drill. There's an engine I'm putting back together slowly. There's no no rush on that. It's just for the sake of doing it and saving it from itself. Uh, stores, metal stores, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, workbench and I've got more things planned and stuff to go on the walls and more storage and spotlights and all sorts but yeah things take time and cost money but that's how, how it goes so back to this so again um, I'm just going to basically be replacing nozzles and these all these bodies are going to get stripped down completely uh, depainted degreased cleaned uh, and any faces that need to be sort of cleaned and lapped will be lapped and what I mean by that throw quite a common issue with with these is the top of that hole there is where one of these banjo bolts will go in for example and this is your spill rail and on the top here you can see the spill rail so what happens is the diesel is not just a fuel it's a lubricant it's also a cooling agent um, when a engine runs one of the hottest points to receive heat directly one of the most sort of aggressive components to tolerate heat is a diesel injector tip and the reason that is is it it's sticking right in to the most um, sort of direct place where that combustion process is happening and you're getting over a thousand degrees that flash that flash burn it reaches a thousand odd degrees and that heat is absorbed away by the, the cylinder wall piston um, the water jacket which if it's air co uh, water cooled so you've got to manage that heat also the diesel in the injector that isn't burnt off that lubricates it takes some of that heat back away and dumps it into the tank your main holding tank and that in itself creates other problems in itself these um, BMC engines, so this BMC engine here, which is what these injectors go into, these are indirect injection. So these do not have the injector going straight into the piston crown. It's actually a little place in the head. Uh, it's the pre-combustion chamber is built in the head. The, the piston crown is a different shape to that, to a, to a Perkins that's direct injection. So there's, there's direct injection and uh, indirect injection. So with indirect injection, you've got glow plugs. So if you've got four well, basically you have one glow plug per cylinder if it's uh, uh, indirect injection and that's preheat and the idea there is that you're applying cold fuel cold air into a cold engine but you've now created a hot pocket once you've given that preheat over and that hot air helps the combustion process start up in a very cold day so when you're holding the key and you've got that light come on the dashboard if you've got one and you're waiting for 60 seconds and that sort of intermediate period and then you try start the engine should help it run up in the cold weather. Direct injection is a different process. It's much higher compression. Um, and you probably have a bigger starter motor on these older engines and they just generate a bit more heat from purely mechanical force. Whereas these engines, so this engine here, still generating high compression, but 
you're relying on a cold starting aid. Now the Perkins engines do have a preheat, but it's actually in the air in, uh, air induction manifold, the air intake manifold. So it's it's not as effective. All it's doing is create it's allowing the manifold to warm up slightly and just create a little warmer pocket of air to help get one of those cylinders to to, to run. And once you start one, you tend to get the rest kicking off. And then as the engine warms up to its operating temperature, the injectors will be getting hot and they'll start to then atomize fuel better. So if you've got old injectors and the engine's running a bit smoky on startup, but it starts to clear up as it warms, that's because the fuel is cold, but it's spraying better. So if you can imagine, so let's just pick on butter. Butter is a favorite thing of mine. When it's, when it's room temperature, it's quite hard. It, it might spread, but not spread as well. The warmer you get it, the more liquid it becomes and the easier it will be to spread. Same as here. If you're getting really bad spray pattern and you're just getting it the fuel coming out in thick in thick drops you're getting a really bad burn and the engine won't run very well it'll run really smoky really bad it'll get knock and it'll be awful what you want is a really fine mist of spray so the atomizing the fuel and you'll draw you're using that to mix in so you've got swirl chambers that's what the pre-combustion chamber is all about as well you get that swirl so as the air comes in it's swirling in the chamber swirling in the piston and the piston comes up and squashes crushes all that that air and fuel and you get a combustion process and there's a certain point upon which you want that combustion process to happen which is where timing comes into it because if you have pre-ignition you can stress components going in the wrong direction for that energy to be made use of so for example if the piston is coming up and then it fires you're now fighting against that firing force and you're damaging the piston the comrod the bearing the crank all sorts of stuff and it's very very detrimental to your engine so as the as the piston comes up and that's the compression stroking it, all the air fuel mixture has been squashed to the correct amount it'll come back down just as it comes back down past top dead center on a on a bmc it's 22 degrees before top dead center sorry so it gets correct so as the fuel is injected in the engine that mixture has been compressed together just as it starts to reach full compression rate that's when it fires and then the piston will come down and do the work it's a very fine balance the older and older systems were all mechanically governed so basically there's a, there's only a certain range you can physically set these engines to work within a modern vehicle like my transit custom other modern vehicles they have electronic control systems and common rail now common rail was different so for example this is a dpa pump this pump is the same kind of pump that goes on the perkins um, but this one only has four outlets whereas that one has six because it's six injectors six cylinders so these engines are they use the fuel pressure to govern the fuel some of them are mechanical but again slight tangent and as they operate um, you're getting an amount of fuel being delivered because the rotary pump that goes up through the line and it will work against the spring inside the injector um, and that will open up the, uh, the the valve inside effectively or the pintle or the nozzle and that that pressure will bypass the spring pressure and then allow it to spray into the engine you can only control that to a degree so when you put the throttle forward you're telling the governor in the injection pump to deliver more fuel and if you just do a gentle arm forward, you'll get a nice increase of power on the engine, more speed, and you won't get a load of smoke out the back. But if you just go really quick on the throttle, the engine will spond, but you'll get a thick puff of smoke because what you've done is you've delivered way more fuel than the engine can burn at that RPM range. And what will happen is the injection pump, provided you're still forward on the throttle, will keep delivering that amount of fuel. The engine will catch up with the fuel delivery and then it will start to burn clean again. So if you increase fuel fuel amount reasonably, you'll get a clean burn. However, modern vehicles, you put your foot down and the computer goes, no, 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 no. We know you want to go faster, but we're going to respond to that, that demand, that command, and we'll open up the fuel a little bit at a time to get to that desired point of range. And once that happens, you're getting a nice, smooth, cleaner burn. And that's all to do with uh, fuel efficiency and therefore fuel cleanliness. Because you're just dumping all this gas out the back, all this smoke. You're actually throwing out unburnt fuel and it's bad for the environment and a waste of fuel. And not good for the engine. So modern vehicles have advantages and I like some of that stuff for, for various reasons. But it's finicky. This stuff is far more tolerable to abuse, as in contaminants of the fuel. Um, whereas modern stuff is, it's, oh crikey, it's... Yeah, you, you, you mess about with those modern vehicles and those diesel injection systems and you'll be paying thousands and thousands of pounds out per repair work. This is hundreds. Modern stuff is thousands. It's, it's incredible. And the, and the thing is with, um, like, for example, so this is a piece from inside the injection pump, which is just there. Uh, these are so highly precisely um, machined 
that just me warming up in my hand could cause it to not fit back in the body. There's, a, there's actually a, a piece inside that which is so finely precise. Do the same, I got shown it once in a shop. If you hold it in your hand and take the in, insert in it that's not warmed up, it won't fit because the outer body's got so warm, it's, it's swollen slightly or expanded. And that's how fine a tolerance we've got. You, you, you've got to be so careful with, with injection system stuff. I don't really like to play with these pumps, but it was it was a solid pump. It, the head seized, the rotor's free, but I thought I'd have a look inside just to see what was going on, but I decided no, it, it needs to be replaced. Anyway, waffling, I'll take one of these apart, show you a bit closer in a sec, and then I'll show you what it looks like on the uh, machine. So, a closer look at the, um, the injector here. So, as I say, this one is from a direct injection engine. So the nozzle's slightly longer, and that's to reach through the engine head and go down into where the piston crown, as we call it, reaches the highest point. And that would come up here, and this nozzle would stick just slightly into the crown, and there'd be a special swell, pa a swell chamber in the in the piston crown. And every manufacturer came up with their own design to try and try and create more efficiency, more power, um, and get the mixture of fuel to propagate and burn as best as possible there's, there's loads of literature on that and loads of information but I'm not covering that particular aspect at the minute so with this particular design they're very simple to sort of service really you, you unscrew the top here um, these are done up quite tight but don't drop them I've already undone this and my hands are slightly so this is simply a cap yeah that comes off this is a locking cap you'd get a return fuel coming up in here and this is this is holding back a spring and that spring inside is quite a, a um, high tense spring. So that works against the plunger, which works against this nozzle here. Um, but basically, unscrew this. It's just a cap. There's probably a little shim inside that to stop the body wearing out. There's your spring. Take that come out. There's your rod. That works down on the nozzle. So that's what's inside there. These are a bit dirty and there's loads of muck and all sorts in there. And these are all torqued up. I've already undone this one before, just because it's easier than doing it on camera. Um, and then it's just a close fit on there. That's your body. There's nothing more to it than that. And then inside, this is the nozzle I've shown you before. That's just a case. Nothing to it, really. And then this is the most precise part. So inside this is this plunger, if you like. So what's happening here... And again, if I held this long enough in my hand and warmed it, that probably won't fit anymore. These are so highly precisely machined and polished. If you get water or grit down there and they start to corrode, they can cause issues. You can get them sticking open and doing all sorts of damage. So if you look at the end, it's actually chamfered. Um, what happens here, I don't want to force that in, I just want to gently allow it to drop in there. I'm going to replace them anyway, but still. So fluid is passed in here, and as that fluid the pressure builds up inside that it overcomes this spring because this rod I'll show you so that's basically how this is assembled inside the body that spring once you wind that cap down I'll try and do this with two hands so there we go so when you do that that spring up you're putting more tension on that spring which means you need more fluid pressure to bypass the pressure here and open that nozzle and spray and then you're, the way they designed that was fluid comes down and surrounds the round, around the end of this and works against this, this, this collar here and pushes this needle back away from inside here. And you can't see it on camera, but there's actually three tiny, tiny holes uh, at the very end of this. And I'm going to take you over to the, the test machine and show you that now. Okay, so this is an injector that I haven't taken apart yet. It's all still torqued up, got the copper spring in the top of this locking cap on here. And you simply attach it to here. Once it's spun up. So this is basically an injector pump like it's got a pressure reading gauge on the top here and that tells me how much it's, it's going to take to open up this nozzle 
I'll get my trusty empty bottle, which I've left here. This is white diesel from the garage. Yes, it's expensive, but it was just the simplest thing to grab hold of. And what you do is you simply pump it. And that's now taking fluid from the reservoir behind here and bringing it up into this chamber and loading up pressure. It takes a little while to get up to its pressure. Watch the gauge, that's starting to move. So now pressure is building inside the pump and the injector. It takes a little while to get up to its pressure rating. We've gone past 1,000, it's 1,500. It's 2,000. So now if I wind this in, we've gone past 2,000. Two and a half, there we go. Just about, I'd say, 2000 and that's a wet one out, so 2005 psi, roughly speaking, for that to just go squirt. But if I pump it harder, you can probably hear it. I'm trying to hold that down whilst doing it, but um, it's not the best way to do it. Let me do it this way. Right, I'm going to take you down here and show you the bottle. I'm not sure how clear that is and how well that's come out on camera. There's probably better videos on the internet with better equipment, but that's what I've got to show you with. Right now. So basically, what you want is um, a good spray from your injector. If it's um, the body's damaged or anything like that, generally speaking, the bodies that get damaged are on sort of much narrower injectors. So. I had a, a Lister, set of Lister injectors, for example, from my, I think it was a uh, SR3. That was some time ago. I took that, took those in actually. I didn't have this rig at the time. And on the machine, the guy was going like that, and you could hear the plunger going. Aah! Whereas, so this plunger was stuck inside the body, and it was grinding metal. And that's how badly damaged that that injector was. Uh, what was happening was the seal wash at the bottom of the um, uh, injector. So. What you need is a little copper washer like this and that fits in over the like that and this face here is what makes contact with the engine head and that creates a seal and that's what stops all the compression gases and the and the, the bang from escaping the engine if you like so on that engine i think they used um that's uh, a fiber washer uh, asbestos i prefer copper but that's what was in there and you still get them now but that had burnt away for whatever reason that dis dis disintegrated so you're getting uh, combustion gases going around the body of the injector um, and the body was getting hot and it distorted and damaged and that had to be replaced I think the injector was dead in the end so what you're getting is you weren't getting a nice spray pattern you want a nice mist from like a water sprayer for uh, gardening if you like like you spray your plants you don't want to douse them with a super soaker or a jet wash you want a nice spray pattern um, but yeah so what you're getting with this injector is a reasonable pattern it's not not too bad um, but we're going to change them because there's, there's loads of carbon build up and they've they've had a life as i say i've got new nozzles here um, they weren't cheap like everything nowadays these are sealed not opened yet uh, these are italian i'm told um because i couldn't find any oems and they're almost impossible to find i found about eight but that wasn't enough i didn't want to mix nozzles and want to be the right set so all right enough waffling i'll um get an injector apart and watch me do that see how that's done um, and I'll put one together and test it and you can see that okay. so that's all the injectors all taken to pieces all the old nozzles lined up uh, banjo bolts excuse the cable all the banjo bolts and fixings sorry injectors to the engine header in there I may actually change these although looking at threads no, they're in good nick. I might change the nuts. I got I got um, imperial nuts, but the the studs are in good order. Um, 
banjos are in good order it's a little bit of surface corrosion so but um so basically the next process here is just a, a degrease wire brush the bodies and all the paint off and clean them all up clean all the threads up and uh, remove all the carbon out of these ends make sure they're as clean as possible uh i mean the cleanest possible way i can cleanliness is absolutely vital at this stage um everything will get wiped down here um, need to assemble these injectors in the cleanest possible way I can. The fuel that's in that was bought the other day. That was all taken apart and cleaned out recently, as in the the, the test kit, because you, you've got to make sure it's clean as possible. Um, and the spill rails will get wire brushed and cleaned. And I may end up, I may actually lap or polish up where the banjo's um, faces are because they're a little bit well, not too bad. But I'd like to just take a stone. So once I've cleaned all the paint and taken off any remaining stuck on copper washers, which there is, I've got a really nice um, diamond stone somewhere. I don't know where I put it, but it's a double-sided stone. And just give them all a little lap, a little polish, just so that they've got nice clean faces. I'm not going to go mad. And I may do the bodies of the um, injectors as well, just to make sure that when they go on, they don't leak. Um, doughty seals are good, actually. So I may go from copper to doughty to see what mood I'm in. The difference between copper is copper is just a solid copper. Heads you see in that box, um, dig it out for you. Um, hang on, it's always something leaning on me. So that's a whole selection of copper washers in there, but they're solid. So you can heat them up, like get them red hot, and that kneels and makes them soft again. There's another type of washer, which is a steel outer body, but it's rubber in a core. And the idea is that you can't crush them any more than the steel outer body, but they've got a nice soft rubber. They're very good for pitted and damaged surfaces, um, and they have different reasons for application, but I've ordered copper washers because I need to top up my supplies. Um, but yeah, I, I'm digressing. It, it's really not much to it, really. It's just a case of clean, uh, dress, prepare, um, bolt them back, to put them, torque them all back together, the specific torque setting for all this stuff. And then once you've done that, you then put them on the machine without the tops on and you set them up, which I'll show you. But uh, that won't be happening right now. It'll be another day I come back because it's getting late and I've got to... Uh, go and do something else it's the end of the day anyway i'm going to go for a go to the gym and go for a swim with my wife so i'll see you in the next bit bye bye so that's the wire brushing done um all the banjo bolts are cleaned up uh, studs are clean. I've got to take these nuts off because they're stuck on there. I'm going to replace the nuts because they're a bit corroded and a bit knackered. Uh, the thread's probably fine, but I've got new ones, so why not? All the injector bodies are cleaned up and wire brushed. Um, nothing's clean yet. I've got to blast it all through with compressed air, degreasing, good degreasing agent, that sort of stuff. And I need to go inside here and blast all the carbon out because there's still carbon in there. I can't get in there with a wire brush. I've got a little wire brush attachment for a drill and or a, a dive compressed drill, if you like. Um, I've done the spill rails, they're down the side there. Um, so yeah, I could have left the paint on, I was thinking about that, but actually the thing is, is if you don't take all the paint off and all the crud off, you could get tiny particles in when you reassemble them and you can't see it. So they need to be as clean, as clean as possible. Um, I actually need to go around the bodies with a scraper and just take out little bits of paint in the corner, just to be that kind of anal. Um, it needs to be as clean as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a small space I've got here, but I, I try to be very thorough with that. Um, I always have a good clean up afterwards. Um, and once I've done that, then I feel comfortable to assemble things and set it up. But I've had injectors come back from professionals, you know, and then the, the nozzle got stuck open or the pin got stuck open because of, a, because of something. So, you know, best laid plans and all that. So, but from my point of view, I've got to try and do it right. Uh, once I've done all that, then I can uh, open up these sealed new nozzles and uh, get them set up on the, on the pressure rig and get them opening up at the right point. I actually am a little bit short of um, copper O-rings to go around the body, so I need to get hold of some of those. I ran out the other day, and what I mean by that is, so this is the top, and just below this is a copper ring, and that creates a seal when it goes on, but you, you'll see that anyway, so. Okay, enough waffling, let's do some more cleaning.
Oh yeah, lovely. Got a good old clean out. It's pulled all the last bit of carbon out of there, so it's good. Just go around and do them all now. Move. Get in with a scraper. It is all loose, it's just a bit oily still. I haven't actually degreased these yet. Which is fine. Yeah. They'll get good clean in a minute. Can't really show you in there, I don't know if you can see in there at all, but there's um it's just a bit of carbon build up so as the engine runs, you're going to get oil and you know, unburnt diesel back in there and sort of carbonise. And you don't want that. Yeah. As I say, cleanliness is next to a customer not being annoyed with you. You did it properly. Clean up nice. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. So inside the injector, it's discussed, there's your end cap that holds the nozzle on the end. There's your main body, there's your rod, spring, uh, shim, washer, that protects the inside of this uh, adjuster, and then you've got your main cap. So basically what happens is high pressure fuel is injected into this port here, and as it runs into the body, it will run down into the nozzle. It will overcome the spring pressure, which is set by the machine. Uh, some fuel will squirt through, past this body which is screwed up into the combustion process of the engine but some fuel will be returned back up past the spring past the body and then out the top which is your return line because you need to have a uh, constant flow to lubricate those moving parts uh, these are so finely uh, machined that you must have lubrication but also critically um, cooling without that cooling which is taking diesels taking away some of that heat um, but that's how that basically functions
interesting, to say the least. So now the nozzles are assembled, um, the bodies are cleaned and, and dressed and all that sort of stuff. Um, got some fresh fluid in the tester and you just literally onto the top here. There is supposed to be a copper o-ring on there but I've had to order some because I've run out of that particular size. Um, so basically this cap here puts uh, tension on the spring which then acts on the, the nozzle if you like or the, the pintle inside it. A technical term is eluding me right now but there we go. Um, and as I showed in the previous slide, you've got the rod at the bottom. So you need the fluid pressure to overcome the spring tension. So now that's uh, tightened, to make sure I've tightened that up, I'll just spray everywhere. So you just pump it, watch the gauge. And, ah, right, so that's come up to a smidge under a thousand PSI, which is a lot of pressure, but nowhere near the setting we want. So that's the spray pattern in there. Then we can make it out. So that's far too low. So what we need to do now is just tighten up a little bit. So the manual's got various settings in it. So what I've been doing is you've got the 20 uh, MPA here, which is a form of measurement. So I'm going just as it starts to, to touch that 20, it's just below it. It's uh, 2,088 eight something, 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 I think it was in the book. So you just wind this spring in, really not much to it than that. And you just guesstimate where you want to be, just pump it up. So now we're going past 1,000 PSI. Pump again, further past 2000 psi. We've got a bit of back leakage. Oh, not quite tight enough yet because we've we've broken open at about 2500 psi or 15 MPA. So a bit tighter. Okay, like a good qu quarter of a turn, I suppose. And just pump it. Oh, there we go. Right now, use the fine adjustment to see where it opens. We've got to 20, so too tight. Let's back off a bit. Let's Ring. There we go. I'd say a little bit loose there. Yeah, let's go a little bit tighter. And I've been. Oh, this is a little bit fiddly, this one. Come back a bit. 
just as it gets close to that 20, it's giving out. There we go, it's about right, I'd say. Can't, there's, there's nothing finer in there to work off, but that's why I've been setting them all to. And then you now you do a test on the nice pattern. There we go. So all I have to do now is a copper copper o-ring goes in there. These caps go on, and then I have to torque them down according to the manufacturer settings. But as I say, the copper o-rings are on their way. I've done all the rest of these. Um, just got one more left to do there, but I thought I'd show you that. And I'll do a follow-up video once it's in the engine because I'm going to adjust the timing as well because they're running smidge smoky. Um, the old nozzles were really coked up and, and dirty. Um, they weren't as bad as I thought it'd be, but we've done, done a full proper clean out on these and, and checked them over. So let's just give it one more little test up to the point where it wants to give out. Like that. Let's come high and then do a little leak down test. That's like dropping down to 2000 psi. Let's go down. holding out quite well above a thousand psi which is a seriously high amount of pressure yeah I'd say it's reasonable there we go right So I'm just putting the finishing touches on these injectors. Basically underneath this cap is a copper o-ring. <clears throat> I'll show you one here. Just one of these, pretty standard, pretty common thing. That just creates a seal between the uh, top body, the adjuster locking nut, which is also the return line for the return line of fuel that comes out down the spill rail. And that's that basically done. Um, they've been thoroughly cleaned, stripped down, all the crud removed out of them. Um, put back together with new nozzles and then test on the machine and pumped up see where their opening pressure is set them to the correct um, opening pressure which is the book which if my memory served me it's 2880 something psi um, and then you just leave them there to check see whether they leak back quickly or not and they hold their pressure for a certain amount of time and then you repeat that 12 times and jobs are good and, um, so as I say just lastly it's just talking up and making sure that's all good um, I have just done that one, yeah, yeah. And then that's that. So the next stage is simply take it to um, take it to the boat, fit them back in each engine, set the engine up, and I, I'd probably go into advanced the timing on the engine a little bit. Because they're so old, I suspect that they haven't had that in a while. And there's quite possibly some backlash um, happening within the timing arrangement on those engines. So they're not injecting quite as well as they could, uh, or you know they need to be allowed a bit more time to, to do that process and I found that with a slightly smoky engine if, if the injector service alone doesn't quite get rid of the smoke then advancement on the timing is definitely easy to do and because it's an old cav system all you've got to do is loosen it and loosen all the injector lines and just give it a, you know, a slight twist lock it back into place so you go it's, it's not hard at all it's just um, meticulousness trying to be as clean as possible uh, it's all very old stuff this so you'll never get it running as clean as a modern vehicle but the cleaner the better but yeah I'm just talking these down to 50 ps uh, 50 newton meters not psi sorry um it's not specific in the book what to do, put them at but 50 is a reasonable amount i think and uh, that sort of resolves that problem i've got a bit of diesel leakage there but anyway i hope you enjoyed that video um any questions, concerns, give me a shout, email me, say hello. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. The channel's still young and it's still growing. I seem to be getting subscribers, which means 
hope you all enjoy my content, which I'm really pleased about. Um, I've got a better setup now for the workshop. I've got power in here at last, and it's taken me a year to get it organised, but I'm slowly getting sorted out. I am planning a milling machine at some point in the future, That's, um, but like everything, time and money. Uh, I've got other things I'm going to start committing to as well in life, so that can take a bit more time away, but I want the channel to grow. If it can be useful to people and content that can go on there can be really handy and helpful, then please just drop me a line and participate in, in some way. Um, yeah, I've got some other gearboxes out there that are dead. I'll take those apart. They're not PRMs, they're actually hearth. And I'll do one of those soon once I get around to it. <clears throat> Strip it down, show the insides, it's good fun. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. See you later. Bye bye.